good evening and welcome to our Historical Society program. I'm Kathy Cavallari, as I said. I'm uh, the president of the Westboro Historical Society. I'm delighted you're with us this evening. You've joined us. Um, the Westboro Historical Society was founded in 1889 to preserve local history through research programs like this one and the preservation of artifacts. Um, our headquarters is the Sibley House, William Sibley's house. Uh, it's an 1844 Greek revival home of the slaymaker William Sibley, who you'll learn about tonight, uh, located at 13 Parkman Street, which is across from the library right in the downtown of West. For more than a century, the society's mission has been to celebrate local history and bring that history to life through our monthly presentations, Sibley House tours, and special events. And um, if you enjoyed tonight's uh, uh, presentation, um, and if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to like our Facebook page, which is Westboro Historical Society, and check out our website, uh, www.westborohistory.org. And um, as I said, during the presentation, feel free to put questions in the chat, and I will share them with Jim or save them for the end, whatever seems appropriate. Uh, so tonight, a uh, lifelong student of history and our former board member, uh, Jim O'Connor, will present on William Sibley, 1821 to 1890, citizen, soldier, slaymaker. Uh, Jim himself was born in Springfield, Massachusetts and raised in East Longmeadow, where his parents fostered his fascination with history by frequent Sunday rides to places like Old Deerfield Village, Sturbridge Village, and various historic homes. Uh, family vacation destinations were to places like Colonial Williamsburg and Civil Civil War battlefields, which added to his interest in history. But Jim has lived in Westboro for 30 years with his wife, Mary Ann. Uh, he's been a member of the Westboro Historical Society for 15 years. And in this program, Jim will chronicle William Sibley's life at a time of national crisis and dissension. A uh, respected citizen, Sibley joined Westboro's Company K uh, when he accepted President Lincoln's call for volunteers after the attack on Fort Sumter and the secession of the Southern states. Um, upon his return from the war, he became one of the leading sleigh manufacturers in Westboro in the 1850s. And now I give you Jim O'Connor. And Jim's going to share his screen and do his presentation. Okay, let me, let me share the screen. All right, so this is a... This, this is a uh, a presentation that I basically started or, or initiated back uh, in the 300th anniversary. And William Sibley came across to me as, as really an every man kind of a person, uh, a, a family man, um, and somebody who was a diligent craftsman. He was a patriot. He served his country, came back, and um, uh, basically was a rock solid citizen in, in Westboro. That intrigued me, the, the, the commonness intrigued me. And you'd almost imagine you could see somebody like him, and I'm sure you could in, in today's environment, 2021. Um, the story starts with, with William being born in, uh, in Westboro, Massachusetts, April 2nd, 1821. The arrow shows where uh, he would have been located. Um, this, uh, the, uh, the top line would, have, this is the 1830 survey map. That would be uh, the equivalent of Route 9 at the point. At that point, it was the Boston uh, Worcester Turnpike. And uh, my cursor is, is basically shadowing where Sibley's home would have been on the way to, uh, uh, on the, way to uh, uh, the, the lake, uh, Lake Chauncey. Um, this is uh, in 1830, um, his father Silas called himself and was quite proud of calling himself a uh, wheelwright. A wheelwright is distinguished as a craftsperson, a very sought after craftsperson in the age of horse-drawn carriages who could fashion a wheel properly, who could do it with exact uh, dimensions, who could build a sturdy hub, sturdy spokes, and could keep uh, uh, agrarian and, um, and, and transportation, uh, horse-drawn carts moving through lousy New England roads constantly. He was a very sought after craftsperson. This is the craft uh, as well as uh, 
uh, and uh, ancillary skills of, of uh, blacksmithing that he taught his two sons, uh, Francis and uh, uh, three sons, Francis uh, and, uh, and Leonard and William. Um, all three boys learned from the father um, and uh, took that, took those skills forward um, as life, life examples. The, the, the picture you see of the house is obviously the, the, the Sibley house, which is now headquarters for the Westboro Historical Society. It has been um, for some time. Um, when it was built in 1844, it was, it was, the, uh, it was the only brick uh, residence on Parkman Street. It's at 13 Parkman Street, and one of the few in, in Westboro, actually. Um, Sibley, uh, Sibley had uh, uh, five children, unfortunately and tragically, which is often the case of early 19th century. Uh, there was at least three children, there was three children that died before they reached uh, even puberty. Um, and uh, one son, Charles, um, lasted until he was 26. And uh, he was actually uh, the clerk in the post office of uh, the Westboro Post Office. Why these, why these uh, folks died, how they died, um, is anywhere from infections to um, uh, infected lungs. Uh, consumption was a favorite word. Um, it, was a, it was a tragedy. If you look in uh, uh, graveyards, old graveyards, you see that tragedy is repeated over and over again. But uh, Charles did live till 26 years old um, and, um, and he passed away at that age. The only uh, a surviving child that lived beyond uh, uh, that be, lived beyond uh, William and his wife Jane was uh, was Nellie, and uh, she she uh, lasted until sixty years old and died in nineteen seventeen. The uh, <clears throat> what what you'll see here also is an interesting way. This is the uh, the uh, census from 1850, it's a tax roll and it's a census. And what you have here is the household starts here. There's William, there's his wife, Jane, 29, 25 at this point in 1850. Uh, uh, Charles is there at three years old. And now what you have here is an interesting combination of people that lived in the house that uh, worked for, in all likelihood, worked for Sibley. There's a uh, there's uh, a Charles Bushler, 22 years old, also a wheelwright. He happened to be from Nova Scotia uh, and the maritime provinces did provide a lot of labor in, in this area and other New England towns. Then you have an Annette, Annette Bullard um, and a child, Francis Bullard. Annette Bullard was the wife of an employee of, uh, of Sibley that died. And she still retained a, some kind of a residence. I'm sure she she brought some value to the table. But this is kind of the the, the way uh, households that were self-supporting, self-controlled, kind of got on with life and and kept kept the uh, kept the family going. Interestingly enough, there's a uh, down here. There's a Mary Perkins. There's Francis. Uh, Bullard, uh, son of obviously Annette, but Mary Perkins was also associated with Bullard and could have been from a previous marriage or a new marriage, and she's one years old. So it's uh, it's an interesting way to do things, but everything is captured on this on the census. So uh, as I've already said, Sibley built the house uh, as a young man. He left his farm, uh, his uh, his father's uh, uh, tutelage, and. Um, in 1844, built the house uh, at 13 Parkman Street. He marries, he goes on and the next year he marries uh, Caroline Jane Gibson, who would commonly be called Jane, she preferred to be called Jane, in 1845. And then the five children are born and off he goes, um, being a, a father and a husband, simply because he had, he was assured of the fact that he had skills and would be moving forward uh, to start a new life. Uh, he was skilled as a blacksmith and a wheelwright, 
which uh, in the end analysis, in his final days of, of manufacturing would have been perfect for sleigh making, especially the blacksmithing. Um, Wheelwright, not so much, but he was a fine carpenter as well. In the uh, town census of 1850, there is, uh, there's, there's various adults, as I've already mentioned, in, in the home, but also his, his net worth starts to increase. Um, he, uh, he was worth uh, in real estate $2,000 and then another uh, couple of hundred dollars in property. By 1860, he's, it's grown to $3,000 and um, he, uh, he's moving on in life. Um, at this point, his brother Frank, while they formed a lifelong partnership, uh, his brother Frank left the home also and, uh, and went in a different direction. He went to New Haven, Connecticut, and he worked for the railroad there um, in building railroad cars. And um, he uh, then, um, he was married with family, brought his family and wife uh, up to uh, Westboro, took a home in Westboro, and that's where the two Sibley brothers, William and Frank, would form a lifelong partnership in, um, in, in, in um, pursuing um, all, all different sorts of, uh, of, of conveyances, whether it be wagons, um, of course, remaking wheels, making new wheels, and finally, uh, the sleigh trade. So what we have now, now, now we enter into the perilous period of the Civil War, and we're just entering it at this point in time. But prior to that, an, an innovation that, uh, that, that just took uh, the commercial day-to-day uh, -day life in, in a place like Westboro to another direction was the, was the introduction of uh, train, train travel. and, and uh, and trains passing from east to west, from Boston all the way over to Albany by way of Westboro and the train passed right through the middle of Westboro. This was a game changer for Westboro. Um, by 1860, the population had, had risen to 3,000 uh, people. Um, and all of a sudden there was an interest and in, in the ability to make money in other than strictly uh, raising crops in, in, in agrarian lifestyle. Um, what we had was the, uh, was the introduction of, uh, of factories now and, 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 and manufacturing sites that brought a number of people together that could make some kind of a wage on a daily basis to produce shoes, to produce straw hats, straw bonnets, uh, certainly in other places like, uh, like Lowell and Lawrence, you had massive cotton, I mean, uh, textile mills. And so with the, with the, uh, with the uh, railroad, all of this was possible to take your goods and services from here, pay somebody to make it in Westboro and then ship it to a place like Albany, ship it to, to, uh, uh, to Boston or, or other places wherever the railroad would go. And it was a game changer. At the same time, um, also there was, uh, th there was, uh, immigrants, if you will, coming in uh, from Europe. Uh, the Irish uh, came, later uh, the Italians came. Certainly, the, uh, uh, as we've already known, the Canadian provinces, the maritime provinces, lent their, uh, themselves to, uh, to experienced workers. And the, the, entire, uh, the entire situation grew um, and, um, and, and, and took us in a, in a whole different direction in Westboro. And which was a microcosm of what was happening in the north, um, a lot more self-sufficiency and a lot and a lot more uh, ability to command our own destiny, to make profits, make large profits, uh, in many cases, and um, and and not have to rely so heavily on um, on the land and 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 on labor to the land, which was not the case for our for our uh, cousins in, in the South. And um, there was a growing, there was a growing uh, angst between North and South over the fact that huge plantations uh, required, uh, required slave labor, so, simply put. And it was the only way that they could make money 
uh, and and pull in plant the crops and pull in the crops in a timely fashion um, uh, over uh, acre acres and acres of land. Well, this plus uh, plus the uh, um, the abolitionists who were primarily in New England and 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 uh, were were quite caustic about um, ending slavery as we did in Massachusetts in the 1780s. Um, they they uh, it was it was a it was a, a tug of war match that only could be resolved uh, apparently with, uh, with with violence. Now. Um, uh, Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861, and what he tried to do was negotiate a settlement. He tried to offer an olive branch, um, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, the southern the, the southern forces, particularly in South Carolina, who were who were very very caustic, uh, wanted to push it to the point of open uh, conflict. And they picked uh, they picked uh, Fort Sumter, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, bastion in, uh, in Charleston Harbor, um, and the blockade, the naval blockade out, outside the harbor, as the point of contest. And uh, the South Carolina militia, uh, basically from the batteries in Charles uh, along the edge of Charleston, uh, bombarded Fort Sumter, and as we all know, uh, Sumter fell. And uh, the American forces, uh, the American troops in Sumter were allowed to get on the blockade uh, uh, boats and, um, and, and, and leave the area. Um, the, the fact that this happened um, basically just uh, pushed us into war and uh, which was declared in uh, May of 1861. Um, 75,000 volunteers were, were uh, requested to restore the union. Um, and uh, Governor Andrews, who was, the, uh, who was the war governor of uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in turn uh, accepted the quota that was given by uh, the federal government to, uh, to fill regiments necessary uh, under that quota for, uh, for Massachusetts. Uh, April of 1861, the town of Westboro um, and the selectmen of Westboro, in response to uh, Governor Andrews' request, formed a rifle company. Uh, they call themselves the West, Westboro Rifles. And um, it was all done under the uh, Militia Act, which was uh, continuing uh, uh, in existence. And um, over half the company uh, that was formed were men from Westboro. And uh, the uh, the rest were were basically from the surrounding areas, but uh, a company uh, uh, in this era would have been 100 men. Approximately 60 men were definitely from Westboro. Now you can see uh, uh, if if everyone can see the uh, the recruiting posters are the same old thing of reach out and grab you. I mean your country is in danger. It's calling upon you. Fill the regiments. Do what's right step up for old Massachusetts. Um, and uh, this, this generally appealed to uh, probably a lot of the young men who are working in shoe factories, the young men who were on the farm, men, uh, uh, young, uh, young guys who were working 10, 12 hours a day in a shoe factory or dust the dawn on a farm. This might be appealing to them. And how bad can this be? They listed for uh, three years. They were asked to enlist for three years. Within that, uh, that frame of uh, mind, even, even um, uh, senior adults and, and some of the army said, how long can this last? This, this is gonna be gone in three to four months. Uh, we'll, we'll make it a three year enlistment just to be on the safe side. Everyone had the idea that this was going to be a fairly quick and uh, and straightforward uh, situation. So in, in July of 1861, the Westboro Rifles um, under the Militia Act becomes Company K of the 13th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. And they trained as did any other re regiment raised in Eastern Massachusetts in uh, Fort Independence, was, which was out and still is in, in, uh, in Boston Harbor under the uh, control of the, uh, the National Park Service. Um, 
And uh, uh, in July 29th of 1861, the 13th Massachusetts received its colors, received, well, uh, let me step back. It took four weeks, five weeks to turn out a soldier in Fort Independence. Um, that's the, if you can do the manual of arms, you knew how to load and fire the, the musket, you could wear the uniform properly, you knew who to salute, who not to salute, you were ready. And in July 29, 1861, the 13th Massachusetts receives its colors, receives its marching orders, uh, uh, and uh, off they go by train from Baltimore uh, to Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and joining the Army of the Potomac, which was under the, uh, under the command of George McClellan. Now along the way, you can see the train in this picture and the train goes right through the middle of Westboro and that's what we were talking about earlier. As the train left Boston uh, with the troops on board, it, it slowed as, as, uh, as the story uh, goes, it slowed in, in Framingham. So, you know, friends, neighbors, relatives, sweethearts, uh, brass bands, uh, all of this would be brought to play as the train slowed to cheer up the men. They also did the same thing in Westboro. And um, the town turned out um, a, a lot of uh, 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 waving of handkerchiefs, passing of uh, maybe uh, snacks and things in, in, in baskets through the window of the train. You can imagine um, it's, 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 uh, it's exciting, uh, sad at the same time, all kinds of emotions as the boys were going to the front. The next, the next stop was was Worcester. The uh, the enlisted men got off the train. Were able to stretch. The, the officers were asked to come to uh, Mechanics Hall. And were, were were given a lunch and other patriotic speeches before they all got back on the train and headed for uh, headed for New York. Here's some here's some faces that I think are pretty evocative. Uh, these were actual individuals that um, enlisted um, in Company K. To the left is William Forbush. Um, he is 18 years old. That uniform that he's wearing, we believe, is the uniform uh, that uh, the uh, the uh, Vesper Company first trained in, uh, a militia uniform. Certainly, it was gray. Uh, that's that's the uniform they had. Um, William served for all three years. He was wounded um, in 1862. He uh, he. Uh, uh, mended and su survived that and survived uh, uh, the next three years. He was mustered out, but he had had such infection um, and because of his uh, um, in infections and, and other maladies with regard to uh, uh, just the rough and ready nature of living out in the, in, in, in the open air, he didn't take to it well. And as it turns out, he, he uh, probably picked up uh, a disease or um, um, other other uh, problems with with regard to his breathing, which affected him later on. At the age of thirty, he could no longer he could no longer work in the slave trade. He was working for the Forbes uh, uh, slave uh, slave company, but he could no longer do that, and he he was uh, he had to take a, um, a a very sedentary kind of a job at a dry goods store, and the poor guy died at, at the age of thirty. Um, Hollis, Hollis Fairbanks, you look at that face, you think he's the graduating class of uh, 2021. He, he was 18. He and his twin brother, uh, Henry, uh, both signed up, both went off to war. Uh, Hollis, unfortunately, was killed um, at, the, at the Battle of the Second Manassas uh, prior to Antietam. And his brother, Henry, was wounded at Antietam. The gentleman, the austere gentleman on the far right, he was a, a former a pastor of, uh, of the Methodist Church. He was uh, he, he was 45 years old, which makes him the only guy that's older than um, um, than our than our friend uh, William Sibley. Sibley was 40 years old when he signed up, and one would say, why did he do it? I mean, he had a business; he was starting to grow the business. He uh, he didn't have to go. There was a way that you could buy your way out of uh, enlistment, even if you made the mistake of, of putting your name down. You could always back out by paying um, the the, uh, the the correct authorities. 
a certain amount, somewhere between $100 and $150. And he could have bought his way out of this situation. He wouldn't even think of it. Um, as a matter of fact, he was, he was nominated corporal on the popular vote of all the 18 year olds and the other men in the, in the company. Uh, that kind of gives you an idea of how he was regarded, not only uh, um, as a soldier, but also previously as a, as a resident of Westboro. Uh, here's some pictures, some actual pictures that uh, we have in our collection at, uh, uh, at the Westboro Historical Society. It shows a meeting to the left, a meeting of officers of the 13th. Uh, um, and on the right is a field kitchen. Now you can, you can see just from the general nature of things that sanitary conditions weren't paramount. There were multiple ways to pick up infections and disease um, uh, that's over and above uh, being shot at or, 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 uh, or, or, or killed by way of a, a shell burst. So it was, it was a rough and ready life. And uh, um, the, volunteer, the, the volunteer organizations like the 13th uh, Regiment uh, quickly uh, caught on to the fact that uh, this probably wasn't going to end real quickly. Uh, nor easily. Um, as the men, as the as the men were away and and uh, and on their mission, uh, they uh, the the women at home formed a sewing society, which basically uh, that was uh, and Jane uh, Jane uh, Sibley held it right in the in the parlor of our uh, of the thirteenth uh, thirteen uh, Parkman Street home, which we use as our our. Um, Westboro Historical Society, and in that parlor, uh, they turned out uh, uh, socks and uh, uh, cer certainly other uh, knitwear. Uh, they pickled uh, uh, vegetables and fruits, and they packaged it all up and got it to the front lines. And they did that so well that the United uh, U.S. Sanitary Commission, which is the forerunner of the of the, of the uh, Red Cross in Boston, uh, complimented them and gave them accommodation uh, for their efforts. Um, the the uh, the thirteenth uh, um, the thirteenth Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry, along with um, uh, along with uh, other regiments, uh, the twelfth Massachusetts and two Pennsylvania regiments formed the third brigade, uh, first corps of the Army of the Potomac, and they were playing. The Army of the Potomac was playing cat and mouse with uh, Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia all across um, the area just above the, the uh, Potomac River, down into Maryland and going from west to east. But what uh, the, the, the basic strategy, the fundamental strategy of the federal troops as echoed by Lincoln was bring this to an end, bring this to a decisive end once and for all. And um, and um, Robert E. Lee had the same marching orders uh, from, uh, from Confederate uh, leadership um, is find your way into the heart of the, uh, of the Union, find your way across the Potomac and into Washington, DC. Let's end this thing or at least bring the Yankees to a, uh, uh, to, to, to a table for negotiation. Uh, what you see here is, um, the, uh, the, the lines of battle and, uh, and the arrangement of troops and regiments um, on uh, the morning of uh, September 17th, 1862. The town is called Sharpsburg, Maryland, but forever it's known as Antietam because the Antietam Creek ran right through uh, part of the town. The town was populated by uh, several hundred, a couple of hundred, um, basically uh, Quakers, if you will, or pacifists who were of German descent and they were, uh, their religion was, uh, they, they were Mennonites. And they um, all of a sudden uh, over 40,000 troops pretty much evenly uh, split between Union and Confederate ended up in their backyard and over a period of 12 hours, not even a full day, it was the, the most uh, tragic uh, outcome in the entire war. In one day, um, 20 to 25,000 
men were killed or wounded. What we have is, what I have is, and, I, and I'd like to uh, just give you a sense of um, what happened in that hour and a half conflict. It was, it, was, uh, it was given to us by Sergeant Austin Stearns, who wrote a book three years in Company K, and he talked specifically about, and he was there, he was in the ranks, and I think this would, uh, would, would help give you a vision of what, what was going on. Um, he writes, a foggy morning dawned 17th of September, 1862. Each army was astir and preparing for deadly struggle at hand. No fires were permitted to make coffee. A simple breakfast of hardtack was our meal. The sun rose, driving the fog away. Um, what we're doing, what, what I'm showing you here is, this is a church called the Dunker Church. Here is a battery. These are, these are the... Uh, um, these are the Confederate positions. The, uh, the Union position, and specifically the 13th uh, uh, Massachusetts, was in the East Woods right here and launched from here to take on the, the Confederate line. There was 5,000 5, men in the East Woods. They came out, arrayed themselves, and went into a forward charge. Um, so it says, uh, we, we were quickly placed in the line and advanced out of the friendly shelter of our woods and into the open field, recently harvested. Directly to our front and a half mile away was the rebel line waiting to receive us. The ridge behind their line was crowned with batteries and, and some guns placed near a stone church, which was the, which, which was the Dunker Church and then two batteries here, better artillery. All the guns opened on us as soon as we showed ourselves. The first shots went over our heads. The next ones came closer. We crossed over a fence that separated the fields, reformed and went on. I remember looking back as a shell went screeching overhead, see, seeing it explode into the first rank of the brigade behind us. The skirmishers of both armies were having a regular give and take and the Rebs were falling back as we advanced. We next entered a cornfield, and this is a famous place right here in that first, uh, the first morning's uh, element of the battle, which was uh, intensely fought over. We next entered a cornfield, and we were soon moving through rows of mature stalks. Shells now were falling amongst the ranks, exploding into multiple pieces. The skirmishers had all withdrawn and we were halted in the cornfield in order to fix our bayonets. We were now uncomfortably near the rebel lines. When the Rebs first fired, many of their balls went over our heads, but others taking deadly effect. We halted and commenced firing by battalion and company. Men now began dropping on all sides. What happened was they lost their momentum and you had to stop and you didn't have mass in motion in this day of linear warfare, you lost, you, you, you lost, it was a tipping point and the rebels charged, uh, fired and charged and uh, pushed the, uh, uh, the third brigade back. In that process, in that melee, many, many were wounded, including um, William Sibley. He shot, we shot in the leg. It was, it's said that he was shot in the knee, but he received a wound severe enough that he was incapacitated. He, he couldn't move. Um, as was the case also, um, where you have a severe action, many times there was a truce call and um, litter teams went out to pick up the, uh, the, the wounded and got him back to an aid station. We think that maybe there was some confusion and Sibley got picked up by a, uh, a Confederate uh, litter team. In any event, he was eventually uh, repatriated uh, to the uh, to the Union, and um, and and re received aid. Many of the wounded uh, lay where they fell for as much as uh, 36 hours. Uh, some uh, some a little bit longer than that. This is a this is a picture uh, that was actually painted by uh, um, by James Pope of the 2nd uh, Vermont Infantry. 
It shows, as we saw again, there's the Dunker Church right here. This is the batteries, the, the, the Confederate batteries, the Confederate line waiting for the Union um, uh, soldiers who were surging forward in nice straight lines. That, that was an eyewitness account. This is the Dunker Church two days afterwards, uh, 1862. These were uh, uh, Confederates uh, that were left on the field, uh, having not been pick, picked up all the, the dead. Uh, here is the present site uh, as, it's, as it's shown in the National Park Service. That's the same building restored. These are some cannon and gun that are there to show the, the positioning of the field artillery. This is a, this is a monument to the, to the 12th and the 13th Massachusetts uh, Volunteer Infantry. In the place of the cornfield, this is the cornfield right here, and uh, the actions and the courage that they uh, that, that they in, uh, uh, showed uh, on the 17th of uh, September. 22,720 Americans lost their life, killed, wounded. Um, Matthew Brady uh, had an understudy uh, who he couldn't get there from Washington. And he detailed the guy, uh, his, his protege to go film the aftermath. And this is uh, obviously a row of unburied uh, uh, Confederate dead. So our friend uh, Sibley, uh, uh, his, his, his war experience ended uh, on that day in that hour, in that hour between six and, and seven in the morning, uh, the war was over for him. Um, at the top is is actually uh, is actually the um, uh, line an entry to uh, uh, the the uh, orderly books showing that Sibley was now in a hospital in Germantown, Pennsylvania, as a result of uh, wounds received 17 September 1862, and he has a clothing race uh, uh, account set up for him of 77 dollars and 47 cents because. He, uh, he, would, he would need some sustenance and clothing. Uh, the building below, this was the Germantown Town Hall, just outside, it's a suburb of Philadelphia. All of these buildings, all of these wooden buildings were constructed um, because of the, uh, the theater of war in the East was so active. Um, they, uh, this just helped uh, off take the, uh, uh, the, the, the casualties that would otherwise have to go up to uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and um, Sibley stayed here for a period of uh, 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 almost a year uh, convalescing. And um, because of his maturity, because of his business acumen, they, they liked him so much, they, they kept him for a while longer as he was still uh, progressing and made him a sergeant and uh, put him in charge of uh, storekeeping uh, for all medical supplies and everything else. And so he was a commiss came out of there as a commissary sergeant. He wasn't gonna go back into active service anyway. His leg was such that he couldn't, couldn't maintain active campaigning. So uh, this was a way for him to um, uh, go into uh, a discharge um, with, uh, with honor and uh, always, always uh, adding value wherever he went. This is a, a, a picture of uh, the, the monument, which we know very well across from the, um, uh, uh, the uh, town hall. And um, down below in the bottom right is uh, the, the GAR uh, post, I think it was post 80 that uh, was in this area. All these gentlemen are, are, um, are uh, veterans of uh, the Union Army. And I'm sure uh, Sibley is in there somewhere. I just don't know what he looks like, so I can't pick him out, but uh, I'm sure he's there somewhere. And um, so after, after the war, after things uh, came together and Sibley came back to uh, civilization, um, it, there, it, it, it seemed there, there was a real fascination with, with sleighs and uh, there was sleigh makers that, uh, or, or manufacturers dedicated to sleighs. And this was the period of between, it says 1835 to 1899, um, the, um, uh, the, 
the, the Forbes uh, uh, manufacturing site, which was probably the biggest, uh, um, was uh, put, put into production in 1841. A lot of uh, sleigh makers really kind of focused on between 1868, 1870, and uh, the 1890s. Um, it's, it seemed to become uh, very much in vogue. This is a pi picture of downtown Westboro in the middle of a snowstorm. And, um, some of the buildings look like uh, they could be a representative of uh, Main Street, and uh, uh, some of the churches look kind of familiar down towards the uh, towards the end there. The uh, Portland Cutter was one of the more prolific styles, and a style that uh, um, I, it, it was a two seater. It was kind of like a a, a little uh, a coupe, if you will. Um, uh, it wasn't. Uh, it was light. It was. It was. It was very fast. It was for somebody who knew how to shape wood, how to shape metal. It was uh, probably as straightforward uh, a, a sleigh as was possible in this period. And um, uh, Sibley was uh, extremely cost effective. He was. He kept his. He kept his. Uh, his costs uh, to an absolute minimum. Um, he and Frank worked closely together and they would build upon contract. They would not build uh, a particular type of sleigh uh, in mass because they still never left their uh, wheelwright business and their, uh, and their wagon business. So um, some of the more popular sleighs and some of the bigger sleigh makers would make so much production that they would be able to export it to Chicago or St. Louis or other places via the railroad. Sibley's kept themselves close at hand. They put quality into it. They were cost effective and they were very popular, particularly with the Portland Cutter. Here's, here's, some, uh, <clears throat> here's, here's some sleigh maker advertisements that kind of say a lot. Uh, the, the, the Forbes, uh, uh, the Forbes brothers, manufacturer of Portland style, but also you can see style number nine, style number ten. They have a they have a uh, a catalog, um, and up in the up in the upper right hand corner, you you see William H. and Frank Sibley. They're doing the same thing, but they're also you sleighs are one aspect of what they do. They're still sticking to their core. Uh, uh, their, 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 their core expertise of wagons, wheels. They even, they even give the public an idea, we will uh, do a blacksmith job for you. If, uh, if you require it, uh, cut, they'll, they're still working on wagons um, and all done in the best manner at the best cash prices available. So they weren't interested in volume. They couldn't handle it. They didn't want to take on the extra cost and the extra uh, um, labor, but they were very focused at what they did, very personal in, in their treatment of customers. This is a, a, a what I think to be a, an interesting situation. It kind of puts the, the context of sleighs and wagons in the midst of the other industry that's, that that's, uh, was captivating uh, Westboro and this area in, um, in, in the 18, 1800s. You can see that boots and shoes were king, um, and uh, straw hats and, uh, and and bonnets were also very prolific. Wagons and sleighs were very much there, but it wasn't the same volume that you saw in some other areas. It was quite quite required, but uh, the the uh, the uh, um, the uh, Forbes Forbes uh, brothers probably in in, in the peak of their of their experience uh, manufactured uh, approximately 4,000. Four, oh, oh, all of the manufacturers, excuse me, all the manufacturers from Westboro during the 1870s, 1870 to 1885, which was really the, the, the core nucleus, produced about 4,000 slaves uh, a year. Um, the Portland Cutter, as I said, being the most popular. Uh, Brothers Daniel and Baxter Forbes um, had the first dedicated factory in 1841, which is on the corner of Warren uh, and South Street is, is where their factory was. And it was a factory dedicated to sleigh making. At one point in time, uh, the uh, 
the, the Forbes brothers turned out uh, 1,200 slaves per year by themselves. That, 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 that was the purpose of their business. And prices range from 40 to $60, depending on the style and the ornamentation. Um, uh, Frank and William, as I've said before, were accomplished wheelwrights and blacksmiths and skilled carpenters. And all these trades combined in what they did and what they offered the public. Um, and uh, the uh, manufacturing space for the, for the Sibleys, um, back of Frank's, uh, uh, excuse me, in back of William's house on Parkman Street, there was a half dozen different buildings where they fabricated, where they stored material. Um, Frank, uh, his residence was, was over on uh, California Street, which is now called West Street. And he had some, uh, some, some manufacturing entity over there. And they, and they shared some, uh, some, some labor uh, back and forth. In their top period, they probably, including the two owners, they probably uh, accomplished what they did with, with eight people, whereas others would, would have required uh, many more. Um, they, were just, they were just much, much more efficient. Here you have a, uh, a map that shows, um, and we've seen this before, this is the 1870 survey map. It's, it shows uh, a Sibley building here. We think that th this is Frank Sibley's house on, uh, uh, on um, California Street. And uh, over on Parkman, uh, there's, there's Frank, uh, there, there's Bill, William Sibley's house right here with all of the, uh, with all the manufacturing sites uh, and structures in back of it. Um, over here, we think that's a rental property. It's also assigned to uh, Sibley. It could have been where uh, his eldest daughter finally ended up. Um, if it's into the, if it's in the, uh, uh, the estate, that very well could be where she uh, uh, found home after her parents had died and, and her and her uncle had passed away. Um, again, with, with the ability to pivot in a different direction, the Sibley brothers. Uh, caught the contract for uh, beefing up the fire uh, apparatus in, in Westboro. Uh, the Parkman store uh, in March of 1868 uh, burned, and that caught the attention, obviously, of the select uh, board and other uh, uh, members of the town, the leadership of the town, and they set about to get a new pumper, uh, water pumping uh, apparatus, and a new hook and ladder. And the pumping apparatus went to a company called Honeman in, in, uh, in company in, in Boston. Uh, they had expertise in that area. They did it very well. But the other piece, they kept local. And um, a hook and ladder um, in all of the uh, apparatus on that was uh, contracted to uh, the, the Sibley brothers. And um, for a price of uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $240, uh, the town was very pleased, and um, and um, the firefighting capability of the town of Westboro came up three notches uh, ju just with these acquisitions. Here you've got uh, uh, graphic evidence of time moving on from the period where you've got horse-drawn horses, uh, horse-drawn uh, power to uh, horsepower in a combustion engine. Uh, Frank, uh, uh, William Sibley died in 1890. Frank, uh, his brother and his partner died in 1901. Here you see kind of a transition, a very graphic transition of the, uh, of the Parkman uh, uh, manufacturing facility and all of their uh, uh, warehousing and uh, manufacturing sites and the residents in 1903 which would have been a couple of years afterward, not knowing what to do with the property if both brothers are gone. And then in 1913, there's nothing. I mean, any structures back here look like they were uh, dropped and scraped away and you've got the residents only. So what, I'm, what, what you're looking at is the demise of, uh, you know, horse-drawn apparatus for the sake of combustion-driven cars, trucks, et cetera. Now this is a uh, this is an obituary um, that was that was published uh, July twelfth, 
1890. Um, in 1890, uh, uh, the um, William Sibley uh, was not feeling well. He was consistently not feeling well. And it wasn't just his leg acting up. He would just generally did not, did not feel well. And um, he decided to retire in the beginning of the year. Um, and he progressively felt worse, did not get much better. And his family thought maybe a, a trip to the beach, maybe, maybe, maybe a, the ability to, uh, to relax um, by the ocean would, would be for him. And so they contrived a, a visit to uh, uh, Donda Wareham to Onset Beach. And unfortunately, they, they didn't even get through the month of uh, uh, July. Um, he, uh, he, he passed away at the beach, uh, at, at Onset Beach, and was brought back to Westboro for interment. Um, there's, there's, there's a caption here on the, um, on, the, on the obit, which I think sums things up about, you know, attitudes of the general public, attitudes of people who were friends, people who were with him through thick and thin um, about William Sibley. And, and, I, and I'm quoting from the obituary, as a citizen and a businessman, Mr. Sibley was above report reproach. He was the soul of honor, always affable, and in every walk of life, an exceedingly pleasant man to meet and deal with. Those who knew him best miss his general presence, genial presence, with much regret. Um, he, was a, uh, he was a trustee of the Westboro Savings Bank. He, uh, he was chair of their finance committee. He was a trusted and longtime member of uh, uh, Masonic Lodge, uh, the Salon Lodge here in Westboro. Um, he was active in, in many aspects of, he was an active uh, member of the GAR uh, and attended their meetings. So, I mean, he, uh, he found service uh, to others um, and integrity to himself as absolute centers of his existence. And um, people will, in this time, were, were absolutely stunned of his passing and um, were, were quite saddened by the whole thing. This is his final resting place in Pine Grove Cemetery. It's available uh, in the, um, if you know the chapel um, in Pine Grove um, to the backside of the chapel and uh, is, uh, is the flagpole where memorial services on uh, Memorial Day are, are, um, are, are read. And to the right of that is a, is a street. On that street, on, uh, right near the edge of the street in the grass is, is the Sibley uh, Monument. Um, you'll know it because on the, uh, on the monument itself is the Masonic sim symbol in all its glory. Um, I want to. Th this th this concludes my, my remarks, and I, I did want to thank a few people, members of the Westboro uh, Historical Society, Christina Allen, and um, her uh, book on uh, beaten path is a place to start um, all the time uh, with regard to any point in history in the 300-year cavalcade of history. I thank her uh, for uh, her assistance, Leslie Leslie. Thank you for. Um, being a, a, a curator of every, uh, everything that is interesting within our collection and um, your help uh, in getting some of that stuff into the graphic form in the, in the, uh, in the presentation. I, I, I do appreciate that. Tony Weber is, uh, is a friend and, uh, and, and, uh, and somebody I would also uh, uh, thanks uh, sincerely for um, helping me with uh, the Westboro transcript and other um, actual uh, dated uh, information, uh, newspaper prints, etc., cetera, uh, in the library collection of the Westboro Public Library. Mm, that's, that's basically it. Well, thank you, Jim. And you did an incredible job. It's a really very complete. I think I'd ask you to stop uh, sharing your screen so yep. we can see everyone's face and if we could unmute people. Um, yeah, John Huddy had asked about your sources, but I think you've done a good job of showing your, the resources you use. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, you can stop no, screen don't. sharing again, perhaps. No. <laughs> no. And share.
Hit. Uh, and share. Where is it? Stop share. And share, right. I guess. There we go. Yep. Okay, great. Thank so thank you. Yeah, that was really, really incredible. Um, I guess, can we enable people to unmute themselves if they have a question or want to make a comment? Are we? I think uh, they're able to individually. Okay. Okay. So does anyone have any questions for Jim or any, any comments on the presentation? It was certainly complete. You're a Civil War scholar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, I could have well, spent an, an hour just, on that, and that was not the point. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Chris? Uh, I just wanted to say to Jim that he did a beautiful job, and I learned some things about William Sibley from your census and things that I hadn't learned before. So you really turned over every stone to find all the details about Sibley. Wow, every, time, every, every time I tackle this guy, I find out something new. So I try and add it uh, <laughs> in, into the... Well, we thank you for adding to his life and his uh, career story well. for us. Thank you. He's an inspiring person. Any other <laughs> comments or questions? Okay. Oh, Jim, yes. Um, yes. The um, 13th Mass website that you referenced, that's Brad uh, Forbish's yes. um, work. Has he yeah. updated it recently? I haven't been to it um, in a couple um, of years. Not, not, not in a big way. It seems like there's a lot, a lot of stuff. There's a little anecdotal stuff, but not, you know, major findings. Uh, I, I don't see that. Not. I was just wondering if any new records had come out. Sometimes, you know, a new census comes and it's, right. you know, connects. Well, I'm trying to, I, I, I'm, I'm interested enough in the Civil War, obviously, that I'd, I'd like to foster that connection going forward. And so I, I, I'm, I'm talking to him and sending things back and forth and since he's all dedicated about the 13th and, and is connected with Company K, I think we'll have maybe a path for future information. So. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, Ms. John, John Huddy. Yes, uh, thank you, James. That was excellent, uh, as one would expect. Being a vicarious historian myself, I wanted to take kind of the next step beyond what your sources were and ask you to just describe briefly what the actual process was in mm -hmm. terms of uh, evaluating the information and creating a presentation like this. Um, well, it, it, it comes in various slices. When I talk about the Westboro uh, Library, uh, of course they have digitized um, data and, and documents that go all the way back to our founding in colonial times. And, that, that, that stuff, if you like history, you can go a, do a deep dive and not come back again. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> um, our own collection, and I mentioned this uh, with regard to Leslie as the curator of it, we, we've got orderly books in original handwriting from uh, 1862, um, documenting who is who, what their occupation was before they got into the ranks, uh, whether they made shoes or were a soldier, I mean, a, a farmer's son, that, that, that stuff just speaks back as far as history is concerned. We have that information in our collection. We've got pictures of, uh, of the troops and, and, and of the citizens and of this period that uh, kind of pull things together. And uh, as I said, with those pictures of the 18 year old boys, I mean, evocative, they could be walking the streets of Westboro and going to get a, a Starbucks right now. I mean, the, the, the look is is timeless. So all that kind of stuff uh, is, is is how I tried to pull it together. And as as Leslie uh, said, there is a uh, there is an organization, um, uh, two or three guys, who have actual lineage back to the 13th Massachusetts uh, Volunteer Infantry, and um, they have made it their 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 work of substance to do everything they can to pull together information to an excruciating amount of detail on the 13th Massachusetts Regiment, who they were, where, what they did, where they, where they went, um, uh, and, and everything about them. So you combine that stuff and that was kind of the major, major pieces. Jim, <laughs> on the, the uh, search for anything we could find that was kind of pictorial. So um, you'll see a lot of references to the um, state and national census records, which are kind of handwritten in script. 
Um, and then it showed, uh, the one thing I noticed, um, and I didn't notice the last time, was um, when um, the household of the state census for William Sibley, um, the Forbes live right next door to them and they were sleigh makers. And I he saw, was a wheelwright. I saw that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're only one, one line up and there's the Forbes. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're usually like the next door neighbors. And I was like, wow, you know, um, that's good for business when you live <laughs> next door to a, you know, because he, we always saw him as a sleigh weight maker, but he listed himself as a wheelwright. So he, oh, did he, he, he insisted. He, he, he took that as a very serious uh, uh, handle. His, his wheel, wheelwright was, was his core uh, expertise. Yeah. And then a final question I promised, Jim, uh, is do we have any photos of either of the siblings? Uh, there was one young man in uniform uh, in the slide where he had the roster. And I was half hoping you would say, and there's the guy right there, Corporal no, Sibley. No, that guy was C.W. Const Comstock, and he wasn't even from Westbury. He was from Upton. And uh, he, he was in the Class A uh, federal full-dress uniform. And right. I will tell you, and I will tell you this, just uh, you got me talking about the Civil War, and I was just going to say one more thing. They formed a company of 100 men and boys. 100 men going off to war and uh, they left um, Fort Independence in July, 14 months later, standing in the ranks, forming, coming out of the woods uh, in attack at Antietam. There were 35 of them in the ranks. That was after 14 months of campaigning, of going all the way across Virginia, down through upper Maryland, and stopping them from going to, to uh, Washington, D.C., there was 35 stalwarts left in the ranks. Um, I, I think that's remarkable. Yeah, we, I, we looked for pictures of William Sibley exhaustively, and he was such a, a, a modest, uh, un, uh, unassuming guy that, you know, aside from being somewhere in that Grand Army of the Republic photo, there are really no photos of him so that John, we could find. John, I know you're, you're a genealogist. You're, you're a big time furrow in and figure things out guy there could be a special reward for you if you can find a documented <laughs> sibling picture so that's my right. idea is, is to do it through maybe ancestry.com and mm. see if the sibley family posted you know as part of their genealogy mm -hmm. and have an old photo so that's your don't. homework assignment john well jim I, i've got yeah. a foundational phrase acronym never again volunteer yourself <laughs> well I, but, but being a, a ancestry subscriber i'll give it a whack uh right. it's it's huge in terms of the data that they have right and i've been whacking at that for four years uh and uh let me see if i can find any sibley photos or other information in that vast uh, storehouse. Thanks, John. Did Nellie have great. children, Jim? Sorry? The last surviving daughter. Did she have children? Did she no. marry? No. no, she never that married. That might be our problem. Yeah, it's somewhere buried in the family or whoever inherited her stuff. It was so unless like. Frank's family. Right. Yeah. And I didn't, yeah, it, it, in the greater family, did Frank have any, uh, Frank's family have any collection of photos? I don't know. Uh, we also, I probably haven't gone over to the Antiquarium Society in dug through every newspaper of the time that might have involved Westboro and maybe there's a photo in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Well, I always, I was also thinking, I, I tried to, to approach the Masonic Lodge and they didn't have anything uh, on him. Maybe he wasn't vault, vaulted enough to a big enough position to, to have something. But the other, since he was uh, on a, he was a trustee for, I think several years, the Westboro Savings Bank, I don't know, it, it, do they have any lineage that that's kept anywhere at, when they went to a video or? Somebody would have to contact them. They're a historian yeah. or you know their archivist. But yeah. you know he's. It will stay on the search for pictures of William Sibley. I I I, I got a good feeling John's going to come up with something. Right? Could be. Oh, could be. I I just want to thank everyone for coming this evening. I want to uh, remind people our next program is going to be in about a month. It's going to be Monday, April 26th at 7 p.m. It is co-sponsored with the Westboro Community Land Trust, and it's on a subject many of us love 
birding. We're going to look at the legacy of birding in Westboro. It's going to be a two-part presentation. I'm going to do a presentation in the first part on Edward Howe Forbush, who, is, who was the state ornithologist in Massachusetts, uh, 1908 to 1928. And as a youth at 18, he created the case of stuffed birds that's in the library. And I'm going to tell you all about him. He's a very interesting gentleman. Uh, and then I will be followed by Wheaton biology professor Scott Shumway, who was the former president of the Land Trust, and local ornithologist Professor Sean Williams, who's visiting at Holy Cross. And they're going to describe favorite sites for bird watching in Westboro. So all the nature lovers should enjoy that program. That's going to be again April 26 at 7 p.m. And you can go to our website or our Facebook page as that approaches and be, and be able to register for that program. Great. And thank you very much for attending, and we hope you enjoyed the evening, and we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Jim, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, you. Jim. Yeah, excellent job, Jim. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Bye. That was great, Jim.